Oh, that's nice to get a nice good morning on a winter morning. That's nice. There's a bit of warmth in the room. I appreciate that. So for those of you we have not met before, my name is Alice Kinyua, originally from Kenya, where it's warmer. <laughs> and I'm just glad to be bringing God's word to us today. So we've been looking at the letters, the seven letters that God, Jesus Christ himself, wrote to the churches, to the seven churches. And the question we've been asking ourselves is, if Christ was to write to us a letter as St. Stephen's, what would he say to us? And that is a question we have to keep asking ourselves as we listen to what Jesus is saying to these churches. So I just need to issue a disclaimer over here. And I see most of the kids are gone, which is absolutely fantastic. But I was just going to say that some of the contents I have um, to share today just requires a little bit of parental guidance. So if you're here and you require parental guidance, just find a parent. Um, but, but also, I will hopefully use a couple of pictures as I share this message that might be a little bit graphic. But I, I use them for effect. But I just want to give us that warning as we begin, so that you can just bear with me and journey along with me as I share to this message. Are we game? Yes. All right, thank you. <laughs> so a little bit about the letter to Theatira. Now, this is the longest letter that was written of the seven churches. It's the longest one, and we're going to see why. It's because Jesus has some choice things to say to them. And just to give us a background about this um, place, the city called Theatira, <clears throat> Excuse me. It is found in modern Turkey today, and the city actually exists, but now under a different name, it's called the city of Akisa. Now, if we get that image, you will see that there is a lot of, you know, um, ruins and remains from the ancient days that have been preserved. Out of this, we are able to get some good detail to help us understand the kind of lives these people lived in those days. One of the things we know that these guys did is that they were trades people. They were involved in things like weaving, in making of cloths and dyes. Um, you remember in Acts, uh, Acts chapter 16, we, we hear of a lady called Lydia who was from Theatira and she was a merchant of purple. Now purple used to be exotic, very expensive, and it was only produced in Theatira. So anyone who did that business definitely was among the wealthy people. And so they were very good at that. But they were also involved in things like pottery and did a lot of metal works, um, especially work with bronze and with brass. So these were skilled people. They did a lot of work with their hands. And to make their trade or their skill trade worthy or make business sense, they decided to come up with what we call trade unions. You guys know those things? Well, they didn't start today. And it was for logistical reasons, I mean the very logical reasons. One, they actually helped to protect the businessmen and their craft. They made sure that they got good prices for their market. They actually ensured that they got market to begin with. But one of the biggest things that this union offered is that they were able to transport goods from this little city called Theatira to the entire Roman um, Empire. And so they could get market all over the place. And it just not was not transport, but safe transport. Because again, you can tell in those days, transport was not necessarily, necessarily the most advanced. It took a long time. There was a lot of risk of passage of goods, and especially such good quality goods. And so if you lived in Theatira, then chances are you are a tradesperson. And chances are you could not advance in business if you're not a member of the trades union. And so the trades union became powerful, absolutely powerful and a force to reckon with. Now there was only one problem, is that in the meetings of these unions when they gathered to meet, their meetings were basically synonymous to temple idol worship. And their meetings constituted of rituals of offering sacrifices to the idols and also a lot of sexual immorality because part of their regular worship was the indulgence in sexual orgies, which was just part of the cultural um, worship. Now, at the beginning of this sermon, the first church we learned about was the church of Ephesus. Remember that? Now, Ephesus was the city of the goddess called Artemis, and there was a huge temple called um, the Temple of Artemis. 
and we know that that city was rife in sexual immorality because of the practice of that worship. Now, we are told that Apollo was the god of Theatira. And Apollo is said to be the brother of Artemis. And so similar things that happened in Ephesus also happened in Theatira in a big way. And so the people who converted to Christianity, immediately they were faced with a dilemma. Do they get out of their trade unions and lose their business? Practically lose their livelihoods? Or do they stay Christians but still continue going into those trade union meetings and be remaining members of those trade unions and compromise their faith? You see, Apollo had been given the title Son of God. And that was a dilemma the Christians had to face. Now with that background in mind, let us look again at what Jesus says to this church because now some things will start falling into place. So these are the words of the Son of God. That's how Jesus starts. Whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. Of all the seven churches, this is the only place where Jesus introduces himself with the title Son of God. And now you can tell why. Because he's pushing back against Apollo. He's saying, that guy is a fake. That's an idol. He is not the son of God. I am the son of God. Listen to me. And then he says that he's looking at them with eyes that have blazing fire in them. And his feet that are standing among them, they're like bronze. Not just any bronze, but burnished, polished, highly polished bronze. Now, bronze has a melting point of about 1,500 degrees Celsius. Now, that is really hot. And these people would have gotten that image immediately, that just like nothing can stand in the way of such kind of fire, nothing can escape the eyes of Christ Jesus, and nothing can stand in the way of his judgment. And he stands among them with a sense of high purity and holiness. And so that's the eyes through which he's judging them. He's judging their deeds, both the positive and both the negative. So these guys got that image immediately because of the background and the things that they did. And so this is what Jesus says to them. I know your deeds, your love, your faith. Jesus says, I know your service, perseverance, and that you're now doing more than you did at first. Now, when we learned about the church in Ephesus, we learned that that was a church that had a lot of deeds. They would do a lot of works and they were busy, but they had forgotten their first love. Now, this church actually has a beautiful commendation here because they not only have deeds, but they've kept their love. They've kept their faith. And they also persevere through all the trials and persecutions. And Jesus said, even better than that, you're doing more now than you did before. What a commendation. And what a challenge for us. You see, as Christians, we are not just supposed to be the same like we were yesterday. We need to grow. Our faith needs to grow. Our love needs to be more today than it was yesterday. Why? Because every day we're being changed into Christ-likeness. Our church needs to a place that grows in love and in deed and in a place where the community can look at us and say, those guys are Christians because of how they love. And I think that's a beautiful commendation for the church in Theatira. So are we growing for us here at St. Stephen's? But Jesus' words quickly turn into words of warning and into words of condemnation. This is the longest paragraph of all the churches where Jesus has choice words saying to any church. This is what he says. This is what I have against you, Theatira. You tolerate that woman, Jezebel, who calls herself a prophet. By her teaching, she misleads servants into sexual immorality and eating foods that have been offered to idols. Now you can tell where that's coming from, that worship of that Apollo. And I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she's unwilling. And so I will cast her on a bed of suffering. She wants a bed, all right? Then I will change her bed of sensual pleasure to a bed of suffering. And I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely unless they repent of her ways. And then he says, I will strike her children dead. 
it's almost like a, a double way of putting it. The word that is used to strike is actually a similar word that's used to destroy. And so I, it's almost like I'm saying, I will kill them dead. I will kill them until they are killed. You know, like I will doubly kill them. I, and then all the churches will know that I am the one who searches the hearts and minds, and I will repay each of you according to your deeds. I remember reading these words and just my heart racing because Jesus is speaking with a fierce fury against this church. And unlike other people who are given a warning or a threat, for Jezebel, this is not either. This is a promise. Jesus is promising her destruction and he's promising the destruction of her children and those who choose to follow in her ways and continue to remain unrepentant. He's not even warning Jezebel anymore because why? Her time has come to an end. She's refused all the warnings she's been given. She's refused to repent. Now, judgment has been passed. So Jesus is sending a promise of destruction. And then he says, now I say to the rest of you in Theatira, to you who do not hold to her teaching and the so-called Saturns, and I've not learned certain so-called deep secrets, I will not impose any other burden on you except to hold on to what you have until I come. Let's look a little bit at who this Jezebel is. Now Jezebel was obviously not her real name, but this was a woman who was a prophetess in the church. She held an authoritative position in the church as a teacher. And the church had allowed her to continue teaching, but her teachings were leading people astray. Somehow, Jezebel had allowed people to believe that they could continue indulging in sexual immorality and be Christians, and it's fine. She had somehow convinced people that you could still continue to participate in idol rituals and be a Christian, and it's fine. Now remember in the church of Pergamum that Kenya spoke last week, they were being influenced by the teachings out in the society and God had issues with that. But now he's talking about somebody who's in the church who's teaching these things in the name of God, in the name of truth, and distorting the truth and the church tolerates that person. That's where the warning comes. But this, Jezebel, this spirit, this lady, had, was carrying in her the spirit of Jezebel of the Old Testament. Now, probably most of us know Jezebel in the Old Testament. Remember that woman in 1 Kings? And we, we are told that Jezebel in the Old Testament was such an evil, wicked queen. She led the entire nation of Israel to institutionalize the worship of Baal in contrary, contrast, uh, contrary teaching to what God had told them. It wasn't just a few people, it now became law that they had to worship Baal and the entire nation was led astray. She killed a poor man called Neboth. Why? Because the husband just wanted a tiny piece of a vineyard. I mean, King Ahab owned everything, literally. But Jezebel decided, nah, nah, you want a little bit more grapes? Just kill the guy. She was so <coughs> wicked that she killed hundreds and hundreds of God's prophets because she didn't like what Elijah said. Jezebel was so wicked that the summary of Ahab's time in his kingdom is summarized like this in 1 Kings chapter 21, verse 25. It says, there was never anyone like Ahab who sold himself to do evil in the eyes of the Lord, urged on by Jezebel. In other words, he was the worst guy. And the reason he was the worst was because of his wife, Jezebel. God promised Jezebel, this Jezebel in the Old Testament, that she will be destroyed completely. And he said that through the prophet Elijah. And true to God's word, she had the most horrendous death anyone could have ever imagined. Jezebel, this is how she died. She ended up being thrown off the walls of Jezreel. She was tramped on by horses and her flesh was eaten up by dogs. They licked up the blood of Jezebel. By the time they were sending people to go and collect her body to be buried, they only found her skull, her hands, and her feet. Everything else had disappeared. That is how totally destroyed Jezebel was. Now, that's the picture and the image God wants this church in Thyatira to have in mind. 
when he's raising the name of this prophet and nicknaming her Jezebel. Do you see how serious that is? That is a fury with which Jesus is speaking about the destruction of Jezebel. But what was this teaching that she was doing? There's a hint that we get in verse 24. And this is what verse 24 says. To you who do not hold to her teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, I will not impose on you any other burden except to hold on to what I have until I come. Now that little phrase, I will not impose any other burden to you, rings a bell for me somewhere when I read that. I immediately remembered the story in Acts chapter 15. Now, a lot of Gentiles were converting into Christianity, and the church was in a dilemma. What do we do? Do we make them to become Jews? Do they get circumcised? And then the apostles sat down, and they prayed through this, and they thought about this. And in verse um, 28 of Acts chapter 15, this is the response the apostles gave to the people. And they said, when people convert to Christianity, the Gentiles, they said this, it seemed to the Holy Spirit and to us not to burden you with anything else except for the following requirements. Abstain from food that has been offered to idols, strangled um, from blood, from meat of strangled animals. By the way, that idea of blood and meat strang of strangled animals were all rituals that were involved in how they prepared the animals for sacrifice for idol worship. So basically, avoid anything that has to do with those forms of worship that are not Christian to any other pagan god. And of course, abstain from sexual immorality. A couple of things come to mind for me today because it's possible to look at this and just think, well, well, we don't offer food to idols nowadays in the church. We don't eat food sacrificed to idols. And, and anyway, let's assume there was food sacrificed to, to idols and I was hungry and I came and eat it. Does that make me a sinner? You see, what is going on here is a little bit more than just eating the food. It is participating in that ritual. It is participating in those things that are otherwise not Christian at all. And something like New Age movement comes to mind in this day and age. This is the kind of teaching that teaches a form of spiritualism, but not necessarily a form of lordship of Jesus Christ. And so there are many people who are just intrigued and enchanted by the mystic and the chasing of a supernatural experience. And they're happy to do that out there and then come to church and say, it's fine. It's really fine. And there are very many teachers who call themselves Christ Christian teachers or biblical teachers that are proponents of this kind of teaching. And what is sexual immorality? Sexual immorality comes, in Greek, comes from the word porneia, which is where we get the word pornography. And basically, sexual immorality is any expression, any sexual expression or sexual indulgence that is done outside of a biblically defined marriage. And it's important for me to include that word today because marriage means many things in our society. And it's okay for the world to accept that teaching, but when it comes into the church, Jesus draws a line. He really does draw a line. You see, Jezebel had decided she's going to teach people the so-called deep secrets, that you can do these things and still be a Christian. That for me triggers another movement that we have in our church today, and it's called progressive Christianity. And this is the kind of teaching that makes people feel or think we need to make the interpretation of, Chris, of the Bible catch up with our times. We need to progress, okay? We, it was ancient ways that we interpreted scripture. And what these teachings they do is that they water down the gospel. Rather than teaching about who God is, they are big on things like, allow me to throw in a few big words over here, what we call biblical moralism. So they take the scripture, and the core teaching could obviously be about Christ, about God, about sin, about judgment, but they are just more concerned teaching good values because that is acceptable to everybody else. And the problem with this, we see it even more in what our children are taught. Very many Sunday school curriculums are about teaching good morals rather than teaching Christ. You can take a scripture, for example, like the prodigal son. And the proponents of this gospel would decide, you know what, the takeout for that message is, it's good to honor and respect your parents. Now, that's a good thing. 
but they will water down the question of sin, of repentance, the love of God, and those who are included and those who are excluded in the kingdom of God. Do you see what's happening here? Moralism becomes a big deal. They teach what we call therapeutic deism. Now, this is basically treating God like your personal therapist. God is all about love, not wrath. The problem is we listen to a lot of these preachers on our TVs and on our YouTube channels nowadays. So many of them just will not bring that conversation of sin anymore. The cross is a no-go zone. We don't talk about those things because they're not nice to talk about. And the big one, especially for us in New Zealand, is tolerance and universality. And the whole idea is that everybody is included in the kingdom of God. What do you mean about hell? What do you mean about people who will? No, 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 God does not do that. He saved everybody, so everybody is going to make it to heaven. The truth is everybody is invited, but the Bible teaches not everybody will make it because not everyone is included. That is not how it works. And this is a big deal for us here in New Zealand because New Zealand has taken pride in championing the rhetoric of tolerance, especially as far as you know, the matters of the pride movement is concerned the LGBTQIA plus movement is concerned. And the definition of marriage has become something that anyone wants it to become. So whether it's an issue of gender identity, whether it's gender fluidity or gender orientation or practices, people take it as it comes. And the bottom line usually is this, why should it bother you if it doesn't hurt anybody else? What's the problem if it doesn't hurt anybody else? Why should the church call any sexual practices outside God-given, biblically defined marriage, why should the church call all those other things sexual immorality? Why do we have the right to do that? You see, sin is not sin first and foremost because it offends other people. Sin is sin because God says so. Because it offends him. And because he hates it. That's what makes sin, sin. The proponents of this gospel, what they do is that they eventually make Jesus just a good example to follow, but not a God to be worshipped. But what does the Bible teaches? teaches? Scripture teaches us that every knee will bow, every knee and every tongue in heaven, on the earth and under the earth will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You see, if Jesus is Lord, then his rules, not mine. If Jesus is Lord, then his standards, not mine. If Jesus Christ is Lord, then his lordship matters more than my personal choice. In the famous words of C.S. Lewis, he's either Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. False teaching in church is dangerous. It is so dangerous, and Jesus deals with it harshly. We shouldn't treat it any differently. Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 2 warns Timothy of false teachers, and for good reason. There's a passage over here that is very just poignant in the way it describes what false teaching looks like. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 17 and 18, he says of the false teachers that their teaching will spread like gangrene. And among them are Hymenaeus, Paul goes ahead and name, mentions names, and Philetus, who have departed from the truth. They say that resurrection has already taken place, and they destroy the faith of some. Now, Hymenaeus and Philetus were teaching people that the resurrection of the dead has already mm -hmm. happened. So there's no another life we are waiting for. So live life as you want right now. You can have your best life now because nothing else is going to happen later. Resurrection has already happened. And some people believe them. And so Paul called them out and he said, that teaching is like gangrene. Now, do we know what gangrene is? Well, unfortunately, if you know, please bear with me. If you don't know, let me just bring this to our attention. Because I, I think this is a very important picture for us to have. Gangrene is is a dangerous, potentially fatal condition that happens when blood supply is cut off from a part of your body, okay? And the cells begin to die. And when that part of the cell starts to die, what it does is that it affects the cells around it, and they continue to die. And more and more happens, and more and more happens. Now, when 
gangrene sets in. There is no other way, there's no way to restore the dead cells. There's no way to, to restore the dead muscles around that. The only way is to completely cut it off. Now, when a limb is cut off, it's not a pretty picture. It is ugly. But the reason why you would cut off a limb like that is because you want to save the rest of the body. Because if you don't, the rest of the body will die. Because gangrene does not just contain its death to itself. It kills everything that is near it. Paul says, false teaching in a church is like gangrene. In other words, this is how you deal with it. You cut out those things. Who are we listening to? Who are we allowing our children to listen to? Who are we entertaining and even inviting other people to listen to in the name of their teaching Christianity? Are we able to tell it apart that it is fault, that they're not preaching Jesus? Are we able to stand firm and hold on to the truth as it is? There's a story of a boy. Um, I actually met this boy back in Kenya. He, he fell and he broke his arm. Now, in a fashion style boy way, he decided not to tell anyone, okay? Parents of boys, I pray for you. Because my girls, when they have even the smallest are we, I will know, okay? But this boy decided not to tell anybody. And, and he, he's just stayed with that broken arm. And what happened is that eventually, that arm started dying off. And by the time the parents were catching wind of what's going on, the boy was so sick. And when he was taken to hospital, the only thing that could be done for that boy to save his life is that they had to amputate the entire hand. I have a picture of that boy. And they took out not just a piece of the, I mean, the part that was broken was just over here. But they ended up removing the whole arm right from the top. Now, this is a sad story in a sense. But wait until you see the picture of this mom and this boy in the next slide. Look at that smile. When we're talking to this mom, this was her, this were her words. When they were going to hospital, she thought she was going to lose her son. This was on the day they were in the car going back home. She was going home, yes, with a son without an arm, but she was going home with her son. The next picture of this boy with a smile, literally, there was light dancing in his eyes when he was in the car going back home because his life had been saved. If cutting off a limb will save someone's mm. life, then that's a gift. That's a gift. And what Jesus is doing to the church in Theatira, he's offering them a gift by saying, I will remove that prophetess Jezebel. Maybe they loved her. Maybe it was a family member to somebody. Maybe the people who were following her were friends. The people who they knew. But Jesus said they need to be cast out and they need to be removed. Why? Two reasons. Jesus hates sin and Jesus loves his church enough to protect his church. And that's why Jezebel has to be removed. Now you may be here and probably are struggling with the question of what is true. Or maybe you don't even know what right is anymore. Or maybe your kids are beginning to ask these questions. Or your grandchildren are beginning to ask these questions. And truth has become so polarized and so marginalized. Truth has become something so relative, it becomes harder and harder to find. Let me encourage us, like Jesus said, hold on to the truth. Take this word seriously. Hold on to this because this is a lifeline for us. Jesus says, hold on to this truth until I come. In other words, I don't mind not being a progressive Christian. I don't mind being called anything else. But let me hold on to this truth. Because you see, it's going to get harder and harder. As a Christian, young Christian growing up, I was still called funny names for being a Christian and for holding on to Christian truth. You know, I'll be called so spiritual. Maybe some of you were called, you know, Mr. Goody Two Shoes or Bible Thumpers. Well, that was not nice. But nowadays, do you know what children are called? The ones who advocate for abstinence in schools, the ones who would advocate for sexual purity as sex between man and woman 
in a marriage covenant, they're called bigots. They're called haters. They're told because of their dangerous beliefs, other kids are committing suicide because of the things they're saying. And our kids are carrying this burden with them. And we have to face that. And the question is, how hard does it have to get for us to give up the truth? My prayer is that we will hold on to this truth. And Jesus said, I will not burden you with anything else. Hold on to the truth until I come. There are a couple of resources I could also just recommend for us just as I finish up today's message. Mm -hmm. A few people have taken time to just respond to this big issue. And, and one of the books I would like to recommend to us, because there are resources to help us, all right? Is, is a book called Another Gospel by a lady called Alisa Childers, who's pretty much dedicated um, her ministry to talking about progressive Christianity and how dangerous it is. This is a good book to get hold on to. Not that that's the authority, but this is the authority, but that helps us to interpret our society against God's word. Let's equip ourselves, let's empower ourselves for parents and grandparents who care about our children. Whether we like it or not, this thing is big and it's only just getting started. Here is something I'd like to recommend to us. Mama Bear Apologetics. If you've heard about this, I've listened to quite a few of their podcasts, but they've released some two good resources that I wish some parents could come together and actually just do a study of this book. Now, the, fir the, the, the first book, which is um, on, on your left, uh, Mama Bear Apologetics, it's about empowering kids to navigate the cultural lies of today. And it comes with a study guide as well. So there could be something potentially for us to practically sit down and empower ourselves and also empower our children um, about. And the other one on Mama Bear Apologetics is a guide to sexuality, empowering our kids to understand and live out our God-given design. Grab a hold of those resources if you can. But even more than that, grab a hold of other people because we care so much about our kids. And let us trust God that he will do something in our generation that will make us stay faithful to the end. Jesus promised this church that to those who stay to the end, I will give them the morning star. The morning star is a title of Christ himself. And he's saying, I will give you a reward of myself if you hold on to the truth. May that be said of us. Amen.